Welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to be talking to you about nutrition science. Yes, nutrition science, the lowest form of epidemiology out there. It's a very unreliable science and I'm going to present to you the case why what you read is almost surely wrong. What you're reading in the New York Times, what you're reading in Reuters, that latest health study about nutrition is almost surely wrong. You're probably better off not reading any of these studies at all and just going by what your grandma told you. And let me build a scientific case why that is true. So let's get started, nutrition science. This of course is a newspaper and anybody who reads the newspaper is gonna fall in love with that section of the newspaper about nutrition science. It's a popular section called health. And you wouldn't be surprised if one day you open the paper and you read an article like this, vitamin E increases all-cause mortality. And if you're like me, you're gonna to go to your cupboard and you're gonna open it up and throw out every single bottle of those sweet, sweet vitamin E gel caps because after all, you wouldn't wanna die. And it could be vitamin E, but it so easily could be something else. It could be, let's see, what are their favorite topics? I think uh, coffee, oh, they love coffee. Tea, they love tea, dark chocolate, berries, Pitted fruit, you know, like peaches and plums, they, you know, they get the short shrift. Nobody gives a shit about a peach. But berries, berries are gold. People love to talk about berries. They love to talk about alcohol. They could talk about alcohol all day. Red wine, a glass of red wine a day. Red meat, bacon, they'll sometimes make the news. Of course, never in a positive manner. I see ice cream is in there. We're going to talk about that. So you read the newspaper. One day you read vitamin E increases all cause mortality. You throw out your gel caps. You're disappointed by the news. But you acted too fast because a week later, you so easily could read something like this. The vitamin E mortality study is challenged. A new study questions whether or not vitamin E is actually related to increased mortality risk. So what am I to believe? Did it increase my mortality or did it decrease my mortality? Should I be throwing away those gel caps or should I be lined up in Costco to buy the world's largest bottle of vitamin E? What am I supposed to do? Okay, this is the kind of news we get. Coffee. This is one of their favorites. I saw this headline, the benefits of coffee. It's the number one source of antioxidants. You know, in 1982, when I was born, I didn't know if they were as into the antioxidant craze. I think it crested maybe in the 90s. It was just picking up in 82, crested in the 90s and probably is in a decline now. It reduces the risk of heart disease. Is that true? It lowers the diabetes risk and it may help with colon cancer recovery. That's a, quite, a, quite an interesting claim. All right, I like coffee. This is the kind of thing I like to read over coffee. Oh, but I so easily could have seen this instead. The health dangers of four cups of coffee a day. Dying for a coffee, how too many lattes could lead to an early grave. Is four cups too much? Is three cups the sweet spot? How much coffee should I be drinking? Well, the right answer is of course gonna be, don't believe any of these studies. And this is the latest. Could ice cream possibly be good for you? The Atlantic Magazine. It was a dirty little secret that those Harvard nutritional epidemiologists didn't want to tell you that ice cream could be good for you. But even if that's true, look at the photo. It's got these huge chunks of brownie in there. This is not exactly the pure ice cream, okay? This is quite a, quite a decadent Sunday. All right, is that good for you? And then I saw tweets like this. They demonized eggs. They told you that cholesterol and fat were bad for your heart but it was a lie. Eggs are one of the most powerful superfoods on the planet. Here's why you should be eating them. So they clearly were wrong to tell you that it is so bad for you, but should they be telling you it's a superfood? Is it gonna help you live forever, give you power? Or is it just something that you might wanna eat if you're hungry and you like eggs for breakfast? Which is it, which is it? This was a great cartoon that came out a few years ago. It's called Today's Random Medical News. And I think it accurately captures the editorial integrity of the New York Times Health Desk, which this is called from the New England Journal of Panicking, Inducing Gobbledygook. And how are they deciding on the news today? Well, they spin the wheel and say, today it's gonna be coffee can cause, spin the wheel depression in, spin the wheel twins. According to a news report released today, coffee can cause depression in twins. And tomorrow they're gonna spin the wheel again. Who knows what they're gonna get? And it feels like, it really does feel like the news flip-flops like this. Enter N. Haynes. Why? Why will it flip-flop like this? And I think the thing that you don't get is just how many studies have been done on these hot topics. Enter N. Haynes. N. Haynes is a national food frequency questionnaire. We know a lot about what people ate for decades. We also know whether or not they lived or died at the end. And it is a freely available data set that many researchers have access to. Maybe thousands of researchers, tens of thousands of researchers have looked at this data set. Maybe even 100,000 researchers. And they haven't just looked for one question. They've looked for 10 questions or 100 questions or 1,000 questions or even some might have, 
at the Harvard Medical School looked at 10,000 different questions. And they didn't just look with one analytic plan, they looked with one or two or three analytic plans. So this NHANES has created a huge, a huge flood of nutritional studies. Let's think about these studies and how, how they work. Anytime you do a retrospective observational study like this, what you're really doing is you're constructing some sort of model. And that model is trying to predict something. It's trying to predict mortality. Let's just take the simplest case. We're just looking at whether or not people lived or died. Do these nutrients extend life or do they shorten it? But you could look at other things. You could look at breast cancer, diabetes, heart disease, lung cancer, lung cancer death, colon cancer death, incidence of breast cancer. You could look at the rate of obesity. You could look at whatever you want to look at. There's so many different endpoints you could look at. The first thing you do in your model, you pick the one thing you wanna look at, but, but mortality, and then you say, like, can we build a model that predicts this? And you put in different covariates that you think might predict it. Of course, the first thing you're gonna put in the model is the thing your paper is about, which in this case, let's say hypothetically, was that vitamin E study, vitamin E exposure. Does having more or less vitamin E exposure change your mortality? But you wouldn't wanna just look at that raw data because very likely, the people who take vitamin E gel caps are different than those that don't. I know a lot of older people who like to take it. I know very few younger people who like to take vitamin E. So it so easily look, could look like vitamin E is a, a poison killing you, but that's because older people are taking it and younger people aren't taking it. So surely you'd want to adjust for the age of the person. And in fact, in these models, we typically do adjust for age. We're not that silly. And maybe we adjust for sex. We adjust for race. And I so easily could run this model at the University of California, San Francisco, where I work in the Department of Epidemiology. I could run this model and I could get a estimate for what vitamin E has to do with mortality. My friend, of course, my friend's based in Toronto. And in Toronto, they care about this thing we don't care about so much in the States called socioeconomic determinants of health. And they're adding an income to their model. Maybe we didn't add an income. Maybe we didn't care about income. They're adding an income to the model. They are running the similar regression, but they have a different covariate they're adjusting for. And my friend in North Carolina, she steps out of the hospital every day and she sees people smoking tobacco. I don't see too much of tobacco smoke in San Francisco. Tobacco smoke is quite rare here, but she sees tobacco smoke and so she adds smoking as a covariate to her model. Was I wrong not to do it? No, I think I was defensible. I just maybe didn't think about doing it. Is she right to do it? I think it's also defensible. These are two defensible models. My friend at Harvard, there's a reason why he's at Harvard. He adds in a whole bunch of other things. He adds in BMI and hypertension and diabetes and cholesterol and alcohol consumption and education and family history of heart disease and any cancer and physical activity and race ethnicity. So what he's doing is he's creating a bigger model where adjusting for even more, more covariates and he's asking, adjusting for all of these things, is there still an independent association between vitamin E and mortality? That's what he's asking. And if you start to think about this, the Anna Haynes data set has done something quite intriguing. There are many investigators with access to the data. They're all probing these relationships. And of course, we're gonna be asking many, many more questions about blueberries than we are about cantaloupes. Why? I guess for whatever reason, people are just more interested in blueberries. We're obsessed with coffee and tea and alcohol. We're just obsessed with that. I guess those because those are beverages we drink that give us some pleasure. And so naturally, there may be a part of us in the back of our mind that says, God damn, this is so good this cup of coffee, surely it can't be good for me. Or let's say it is good for me. I hope it is because I like to drink it. So maybe there's something to that. Why are some beverages so seductive? Very few adults drink milk and I don't see too many papers on milk. You know, I don't see as many headlines on you should drink a glass of milk as an adult. That's, that's not in vogue. And so the, the topics that are hot, dark chocolate, these berries, tea, alcohol, these are hot topics and they may get a thousand 10,000, 100,000 different analytic plans run on them a year. Everybody running that plan is adjusting for some set of covariates that makes sense to them. I didn't have smoking, my friend did. She may have had something else that I didn't, vice versa. We all have different covariates. And then there are many, many investigators doing this. So recently, Chirag Patel, Belinda Buford, and John Ioannidis from Stanford, they decided, let's not think about these individual studies that are covered in the New York Times. Let's simulate the entire research community of everybody asking this question. What happens if you simulate that community? And that was their elegant study on vibration of effects. They took NHANES data set in, in, in several years. They realized there are 417 variables in it. And they just picked one at a time, vitamin D, beta carotene, vitamin E, selenium. And they said, let's run a model where we're saying, does vitamin E have something to do with mortality? Adjusting for age and sex, of course, but also adjusting for 
every possible combination of what I've shown you on the screen, 13 of the most common variables people adjust for, socioeconomic status and race and BMI and any diabetes and any cancer. So they're basically running two to the power of 13 or 8,192 studies that could have been covered by the New York Times overnight on a computer at Stanford. And they're creating a cloud of not just one study, but of all possible studies. They wanna show you all possible studies that could have been run. And this is when things start to get interesting. So this figure is a little bit complicated. I've extracted it from their paper and I've kind of added my own uh, simplified version of the axes and I won't bore you with it because you're probably not that interested in negative log 10 p-values. But on one axis is broadly a metric of significance. They're trying to show you, are these results very unlikely to occur under the null hypothesis that there is in fact no difference here? Are these results very provocative and unique or statistically significant? Are they exciting results? That's on one axis. On the other axis is the hazard ratio, which is a measure of, is this protective or harmful? Protective is usually less than one, harmful is greater than one, and one just means this doesn't seem to do that much. And they have this heat map of all the possible studies they're getting, these 8,100 studies. Each panel is a single nutrient outcome exposure. It's vitamin D mortality, vitamin E mortality. And they're showing you is there's a lot of heat in the map. And then there's this, this plume of blue dots. And that plume of blue dots are individual studies where simply by picking and choosing different covariates, which are arguably all justifiable, you can generate results that go in both directions. And what they find is, I think roughly in four out of 10 instances, that a single nutritional and, and a mortality outcome uh, exposure link um, could either be statistically significant or statistically harmful merely based on what you adjust for. And the heat of the map, of course, is on sweet, sweet one, that this is not doing that much. This is a really beautiful study. What it's telling you is when you simulate the research community, you find that most of what you should be seeing is just plain boring, but you can get some provocative results in either direction. And then when you start to think about all the filters between this result and what we see in the published literature, you might realize that anybody who gets a null result might not tell their boss. Their boss might not feel like writing it up. The team may not think it's worth their time. Only a provocative or interesting result might be written up. And this is called selective reporting bias. And then it's submitted to the journals, but journals might not be interested if it's all null, they want something provocative or interesting and that's called publication bias. And so what happens is from a universe of mostly boring null results, only the most provocative vitamin E saves your life or vitamin E kills you is actually making it into the literature. And then the New York Times comes along and covers the shitty tip of the iceberg studies. That's what they're doing. That's what they're probably doing. Now, let me give you some more data that kind of bolsters this, this story. Same John Ioannidis, again, paired with, I think, um, uh, Joshua, whose last name I'm, I'm forgetting. But this was a study in uh, the Journal of uh, Nutrition Science. And what they did was basically they took a dart and threw it at the Boston cookbook. And they basically hit these ingredients. And for these ingredients, they looked them all up in PubMed. I think eight out of 10 ingredients, you could find some PubMed listing, whether or not that ingredient was linked to cancer either in a favorable way or a harmful way. And here they're plotting you all the ingredients that have been linked to cancer in PubMed. This is a dart thrown in a cookbook. They call it a cookbook meta-analysis, but it's really just kind of a random, a random throw of a dart. And what you see is, sure, beef is mostly linked to cancer in studies and onions are mostly linked to a protective effect. But for many of the ingredients, you find studies that show they both save, they reduce your risk of cancer, and then they increase your risk of cancer. And if I were to articulate why are some trending more in one direction versus the other direction, I'm not sure that's a product of the cloud of possible studies or rather the filter of what we think it should be. You can see bacon is mostly thought to be harmful. I don't think anyone thinks bacon is good for you because it just tastes so good. It just can't be good for you, of course, but carrots and onions and olives, I think people can think it's good for you. So is this in fact the reality or is this just merely an opinion poll of what the journal editors and what the researchers think is plausible? So they had this very brilliant figure in their paper where they plot the z-score of individual studies and meta-analyses. What is a z-score? A z-score is basically a numerical metric uh, that has to do with how likely results are to be seen under the null hypothesis. And 1.96 or negative 1.96 is traditionally thought of as the nominal statistical significant threshold. It's the 0.05. It's that this is 
we think less than 5% likely to be seen under the null hypothesis that there in fact is no link between this ingredient and cancer. And what they show you is when they plot these studies, there's just two bimodal groups of studies, the ones that are bunched around it's harmful and bunched around it's beneficial. And there's a big scooped out middle, okay, scooped out middle. That middle, is it scooped up, scooped out because no studies found that beef or onions were just not linked to cancer either way? Or is it scooped out because nobody thought to write that up and no journals wanted to publish that? And I think when you look at the first study, what the vibration of effects gives you, and the second study, the scooped out, I think it's much more likely that what we're seeing in the published nutrition science literature is not in fact a reflection of truth or reality, but merely a reflection of what the entire scientific community thinks is a plausible result. So I wanna just take for a minute and pause. What is the real root problem here? The root problem here is multiple hypothesis testing. You have a universe of people doing studies that can be done on a laptop computer in a minute, and they are only going to pursue findings that intrigue them. And under those conditions with infinite analytic flexibility, which they do have, by the way, I've only shown you one dimension of analytic flexibility, which is covariate adjustment. That's just one dimension. There are many other dimensions you can look at from what type of endpoint are you picking to how do you gate the time interval of the study to, uh, to uh, which data set you're using. I just talked about NHANES, but you could use other data sets. Um, when you give all this analytic flexibility to a research group, naturally, they will reach both conclusions with some frequency, particularly for ingredients we don't have a strong intuition about. And the ingredients that we tend to see things go one way or the other, we don't really know if that's the true estimate that's coming from the data or merely a reflection of what our prejudices and biases are. So let's move from that argument that the observational literature is just rampant and rife with low credibility studies with infinite, infinite analytic plans to the concordance between the two study designs of observational retrospective epidemiologic studies and randomized controlled trials. There've been a few different reports that have asked for the rare set of nutrition interventions, the tiny infinitesimal set of nutritional interventions where you have both meta-analyses or systematic reviews of observational studies and meta-analyses and systematic reviews of randomized trials or a single RCT with 1,000 people or a single observational study with 5,000 people. It's a lot, it's a mouthful, but basically we're saying we're really taking not just any RCT and not just any ob study, but the best of the best or the biggest of the biggest, the ones that people might think had the most credibility. And we're going to pit them against each other on the same nutrition questions. What happens then? Randomized trials, of course, have advantages that observational studies don't. One, they adjust for both measured and unmeasured confounders because some people who take certain medications, who eat certain fruits, may be engaging in other patterns of healthy behavior. Randomization is solving that problem that may be persistent or residual confounding the observational study. Randomization also solves the problem of multiplicity because you just can't run 100,000 randomized trials of selenium with 1,000 people in each arm. You just And it hasn't been the case. I think I only know of two or three, maybe three well-done randomized studies of selenium. And the final thing they do is randomization anchors the time zero time point. So you're not backwards looking with potentially different starting times. You actually anchor everyone's starting time. So you get the three benefits of randomization. For that reason, I think most of us think the randomization is more likely to give you the true estimate of whether or not you ought to be doing this supplementation or nutrient. So let's look at their results. They look through, I think, 32 different things. And they find that there is some agreement, which I'm going to show you in a second, but often they find very wide confidence intervals, which means that we just don't have a precise estimate of what it's doing in either the observational study or in the randomized trial. And here's what their overall conclusion is. In 23 out of 34 associations, the summary findings of the meta-analyses of epidemiological studies and RCTs are in the same direction. So about two out of every three times, we think it's either on the beneficial side of the ledger or the harmful side of the ledger. Although in some cases, the confidence intervals are crossing one or not crossing one, which has a huge difference. It's the difference between this is still a null result and this is something that we should act upon. It's a huge difference. Of those 23, in only six of the 23, were the findings statistically significant in the same direction. And that I think is an indictment. I mean, if you think 66% is good, I would challenge you and just say, you really want to be wrong about one out of every three things you're eating? I mean, I think that's a that's a certain, certainly high error rate. And if I literally flip a coin, I'll get it to 50%. So 66% doesn't seem to be a whole lot better than me flipping a coin. But if you really look at statistical significance in the same direction, six out of 23, I think that's pretty poor. I mean, I think that's a pretty poor 
ability to hang your hat on whether or not a nutritional supplement or intervention is in your best interest. I'll, I'll leave it at that. I just point out that this is older. This is an AHRQ report from 2013, um, looking at a lot of older studies of, for instance, selenium and lung cancer. And if you pull up the most recent Cochrane report on selenium and lung cancer, you'll find that it looks pretty null. So in fact, that the concordance that we were starting to see might have vanished over time or with better studies. And we really only have one really great study called SELECT that answers this question. So what's my conclusion here? My conclusion here is that nutrition science has nearly no credibility. I don't think anyone who understands methods, multiplicity, unmeasured confounding, randomization, would look at this body of literature and conclude, boy, you can really trust the New York Times' latest story. We would conclude, this body of literature is just so shitty, the New York Times shouldn't even cover it. It's a disgrace to even cover it. It's a disgrace to fund it. They need better methods or they need to stop doing this body of work. These studies flip-flop because simply by analytic flexibility, you can get both answers to all these questions. And if you empower 1,000 people or 10,000 people to do this for a career, you're going to get all sorts of answers. Those answers will have nothing to do with the true effect of these nutritional interventions. They'll have everything to do with the prejudices of the researchers and their community. And as such, it's very hard to give nutrition advice to somebody. I really do think that Michael Pollan's books on the topics, which I read many years ago, were quite good where he was said something like, it's just so simple, uh, eat food, you know, by that he means things with less than 20 ingredients on the package or things that rot, you know, because if you leave, if you leave a Twinkie out on the shelf, it will not rot for, you know, a millennia. Don't eat things like that. So ultra processed, eat food, mostly plants and not too much. That was his simple advice. It's really hard to improve upon that. I mean, don't, don't gorge yourself. Don't eat too much. Don't eat highly processed foods or, 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 or things that, you know, are, are, are novel inventions of nutrition science to seduce your taste buds. But it's really hard to improve upon grandmother's advice. I certainly don't think that any traditional cuisine in any part of the world is unhealthy. In fact, I think that they're probably all good for you. Variety is the spice of life. I don't spend too much time thinking about these nutrition studies because I know that they just have such low credibility. And I really put almost no stock in the latest coffee or alcohol study. I won't make my decisions around alcohol drinking or coffee drinking based on anything the New York Times covers. Nutritional science, it's a, it's, it's a field in crisis. There are a lot of people who look for nutrition advice. I personally think that they happen to be richer and have more time on their hands because those are the kind of people who like to read about this stuff. The New York Times is catering to that audience. That's why they're writing about blueberries or they're writing about the bottle of red wine or all these sorts of things. They're writing about butternut squash or whatever's in vogue for the next five years. Eggs was bad, now eggs is good. Butter was bad, now butter is good. These flip-flops are boring. They would bore your grandmother. Your grandmother knew what was healthy based on what she had learned from her grandmother. And I doubt nutrition science has done anything better than what grandmother knew. I really doubt it has. I think, you know, the whole field needs a reformation. We'd be better off by canceling all their NIH grants and just taking the money and saying, look, we only have enough money to run three well-done randomized trials each year. We're just gonna pick three nutrition topics that are, you know, people really care about. We're gonna randomize people to that. I have a Substack post on my Substack, Vinay Prasad's observations and thoughts about alcohol, a very simple randomized study you could do of alcohol. The NIH almost did do a very similar study, but they backed away from it when the New York Times reported that it was being funded by Jose Cuervo, you know, it's being funded by the alcohol industry. Look, I don't want an alcohol study funded by alcohol industry, but I do want an alcohol randomized trial funded by the American taxpayers because do we really want to live in a country where for the next 100 years, we're going to be as ignorant as we were for the last 100 years? I think, no, I want to live in a country where we use science to make progress. And I don't want to answer every nutritional question. I think it's impossible to. I would like to answer some basic nutrition science questions. I don't think we have answers to nearly any nutrition science questions. The last thing I'll say, sometimes I see people talking about nutrition science and they highlight something where, you know, if you do this, you lower NADPH oxidase in the cell, you increase ATP, you actually change this neuron, you change this cell, you change this in a laboratory condition. I put negative stock in these studies. This is even worse than these studies. Okay, these are retrospective observational studies of populations measuring at least the thing we care about. Now you're talking about contrived laboratory studies measuring a surrogate for a surrogate for a surrogate for the thing you care about. You have no idea if it's good or bad to increase your NADPH oxidase on a Wednesday in May of 2023 for how long to do it. You have no idea. And so 
I don't think that's even a useful path. I mean, maybe it's useful insofar as you can use it for pharmaceutical drug products and try to test that. But in terms of giving people health advice, it's seductive, but I don't think it actually gives people any information. There's a crying appetite. I mean, I know so many people who are just constantly looking for the greatest nutritional fix that supplement to add to their diet. The truth is I doubt any of it makes any difference. If you eat a diet with fruits, vegetables, fresh meats, you know, you're going to be fine. Legumes, you're going to be fine. You don't need to be taking these supplements. There's certainly no evidence that they benefit you. And there's a huge cottage industry preying upon people with low credibility in nutrition science. And I don't know what to say. As a scientist, I think I don't have a lot of respect for that. So those are my thoughts on nutrition science. I'll be back with other videos on other medical topics. This is from an evidence-based standpoint, from my point of view as a meta-researcher. So if you like this video, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below. Until next time.